Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the presentation from Clinical Implications to the Right Diagnosis, given by Dr. Olivia Berlinger. Dr. Olivia Berlinger earned a PhD in biology from the ETH Zurich. She is a member of the Swiss Scientific Society of Infectious Diseases and has served as the head of molecular diagnostics for Bioanalytica in Lucerne since 2014. Bioanalytica is a private diagnostic laboratory that was founded in 1957 and is a member of the MediSupport network. MediSupport has a strong presence in Switzerland and provides consistent high-quality diagnostics at a national level thanks to a unified effort of more than 40 clinicians, biologists, and pharmacologists. In her role, Dr. Berlinger manages infectious disease diagnostics to ensure continuous technological advancement. In this seminar, Dr. Berlinger will present an overview of the challenges associated with Sportatella infection with a specific focus on molecular diagnostics. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Livia Berlinger. Thank you very much uh, for the nice uh, introduction and uh, welcome to the webinar about Sportatella pertussis. The webinar will be structured into two parts. The first part will be about the pathogen, its clinical presentation, epidemiology, and prevention, and how it, is, how it is diagnosed in the lab. In the second part, I will talk about a study we've performed in my group where we compared those three essays um, for molecular diagnosis of Bordetella pertussis. Bordetella pertussis is a bacterium, more precisely a small gram-negative non-sporulating rod, and it's the cause of pertussis, which is also known as whooping cough. It has several virulence factors, like for example adhesins or fimbria, and it secretes toxins like pertussis toxin PT. Other Bordetella species have the similar, have the same or similar virulence factors, but only pertussis produces PT. Pertussis is highly contagious and can spread rapidly from person to person through contact with airborne droplets. Some Bordetella have an animal reservoir, but uh, B. pertussis is only found in humans. In humans, it targets the ciliatal epithelial cells of the respiratory tract, where it multiplies and damages the mucosa. This leads to buildup of mucus. Bordetella, other than pertussis, can lead to a milder and shorter form of the disease, for example, Bordetella parapertussis or Bordetella holmesii. Bordetella bronchiseptica is a rare cause of pertussis-like illness, and it's found mainly in patients which have an underlying respiratory disease or are immunocompromised. So uh, what is whooping cough exactly? It is a severe respiratory illness with varying symptoms depending on age and immune status. It is non-inflammatory and occurs without significant fever, but superinfections or concomitant viral infection can occur and they can confound the clinical presentation. It can have a significant disease burden in older children, adolescents and adults, and in young infants, it can be a fatal disease. As prevention, we have a vaccine, and in most countries, you have to notify pertussis cases to the authorities for surveillance purpose. It is endemic worldwide and tends to peak every three to five years. The classical clinical presentation is divided in several stages. After an incubation period of seven to 10 days, you enter the catarrhal phase. It lasts one to two weeks, and the patient has unspecific symptoms like a common cold or conjunctivitis. So it might look like a viral infection. Then comes the paroxysmal stage with the classical cough. The patients cough and cough and cough without a break in between the coughs. So when they finally are able to inhale, it is with a loud whooping sound. Coughing can be so hard that it can lead to vomiting or even rib fractures. In the convalescent phase 
of about two to six weeks or even longer, the symptoms fade, but a milder, non-productive cough can last up to six weeks. The paroxysmal cough might even come back if there is a viral infection at this stage. And there could be secondary complications like pneumonia, otitis media, etc. Most severe is pertussis for young infants. They are at highest highest risk for severe outcomes, such as respiratory failure or death. It is estimated that in the US, half of the young infants with pertussis require hospitalization and about one in a hundred dies. In all other age groups, you might see a long-lasting, non-productive cough as only symptom. They have been described fatal cases in adults, but very, very rarely, and uh, only in immunosuppressed patients or patients with comorbidities. So uh, what options do you have to treat it? It is a bacterium, so it can be treated with antibiotics. But unlike in other bacterial infections, the antibiotics will only reduce clinical symptoms when given early. This means in the catural phase. If you give it later, you kill the bacteria, but the damage to the epithelia is done and the patient might still be coughing for weeks. This means that the infants in the hospital can only be treated with supportive therapy. But, and this is important, antibiotics terminate the contagiousness of the patient. Without antibiotics, children might be contagious up to six weeks. So in general, if you cannot treat an infection, you have to prevent it. And therefore, a vaccine was developed in the late 40s. So we have antibiotics and vaccination to prevent infection and death in the vulnerable age group, the young infants. Here you can see what a success the introduction of the diphtheria tetanus pertussis vaccine, DTP, was. It reduced the number of cases dramatically, but it also changed the epidemiology of pertussis. The largest increase is now found in adolescents and adults. The first vaccine contained killed Bordetella pertussis cells, but the whole cell vaccine had a lot of side effects and was in the 90s replaced by an acellular vaccine. So the vaccine was changed from the whole inactivated bacterium to some chosen virulence factors like uh, pertactin or the weakened pertussis toxin. The consequence was that it had an improved safety profile, but it was less effective than the whole cell vaccine. The protection after vaccination, but also after natural infection, wanes after several years. So you need another round of vaccination, vaccination, a booster. This graph, this graph shows you more recent data about the incidence of pertussis in the US. You can see when the vaccination recommendation was added for booster vaccination in adolescents and adults and during pregnancy. If you vaccinate during pregnancy, the newborn baby is protected for a few months after birth in the most vulnerable phase by the maternal antibodies it's got in utero. What you see also that the incident does not stay at a low level but increases again. What is the reason for this effect? There are several factors that might contribute to this increase. As I mentioned before, the acellular vaccine is less effective than the whole cell vaccine. After several years, the immunity wanes and one can become infected and be the source for infection for susceptible children. About 50% of infected adults do not develop any symptoms, so they act as a reservoir. How about other Bordetella species? Bordetella parapertussis, Holmesiae, and Bronchiseptica are not covered by the vaccine and might confound pertussis cases. A reduction of Bordetella pertussis might result in an increase of infections with other species. The emergence of vaccine-adapted strains has already been described in the literature, for example, a protectin-deficient strain. 
The last two points are, in my opinion, probably the main driver for the increase. Better diagnostic tools, improvement of serological tests and the introduction of PCR, and also the increased awareness, which led to more testing. This observed increase is multifactorial and the relative contribution of each factor may differ between countries. So vaccines are effective, but don't provide lifelong immunity. They need boosters. But uh, we cannot prevent all pertussis cases. So when you've got pertussis, a fast and accurate diagnosis is very important. Unrecognized pertussis in adults is the major source of pertussis in infants. You need to know if you have to treat with antibiotics or not. The diagnosis needs to be fast because the antibiotics ease the symptoms only when given early. Otherwise, the damage to the epithelium is done and will take a while to heal. But you will also treat the patient later in the infection to break the transmission chain. After five, five days of antibiotic therapy, the patient is no longer infectious. Depending on the case and situation, contact persons are treated as well for prophylactic reasons. Even vaccinated persons should be treated if they are in contact with vulnerable persons. What else could be the cause of a pertussis like cough? It could be a classical case with Bordetella pertussis, but also another bacterium like other Bordetella, Mycoplasma pneumoniae or Chlamydophila pneumoniae. Those are the cases which can be treated with antibiotic. But the cause could also be a virus, for example, RSV, influenza, or it could even be a non-infectious etiology. The tricky thing with pertussis is that the optimal diagnosis changes with age, vaccination status, and duration of symptoms. If you see a classical case, the diagnosis is a clinical one. Otherwise, we have the choice between tests that detect the pathogen directly, culture or not, nucleic acid amplification technologies like PCR. Or you can use an indirect detection by serology. For serology, there are many different tests on the market and the comparison between them is very difficult. The antibody response needs about two weeks to develop, so you can only use serology after two weeks of coughing. ECDC released a document in 2012 to advise serological testing, which should also simplify the comparison between countries. They recommended testing of IgG against pertussis toxin. And if this is not conclusive, you have the possibility to repeat the test after a few days to see if there is an increase of the titer. Or you could test IgA against PT. An IgA response does not develop after vaccination, only after infection. The disadvantages of serology are that you cannot use it in the first two weeks nor in infants because of their immature immune system and the maternal antibodies they, that were passed on. The delay, if paired samples are needed, it is only for Bordetella pertussis and not for the other Bordetella. And you may not be, serology may not be used for one year after vaccination. The advantages are that after three to four weeks, it is the only diagnostic option left, and it is not affected by previous antibiotic treatment. These figures illustrate the serological response in natural infection. Be aware that the, the timeline is in months. So you can see how the IgG response against PT evolves. And the same is true for anti-PT IgA. For a useful serological test, you need an antibody that rises fast, but also drops under a certain level after a few months. Otherwise, you cannot identify an acute infection. 
the response of IgA is less pronounced than IgG. The thresholds I've shown here are also from the ECDC document. Switching now to the direct detection of the pathogen. First, you need a good specimen. But the teller targets the ciliated cells. You can find them in the nasal cavity, the trachea and bronchi. The best way is to take another pharyngeal swab, but you need to almost horizontally go through the nose and reach the indicated point. Have a look at YouTube. There are several nice instruction videos there. The second method, culture, can only be done within the first two weeks of coughing. The species is identified by biochemical reaction, serotyping or PCR. The disadvantages are that it is a fastidious or organism which needs special transport and culture conditions. It won't grow after antibiotic treatment. It has a limited sensitivity and it takes several days and it is not available in every lab. The good thing is that you have a strain for further tests like antibiotic testing, typing or surveillance. The third possibility are molecular tests like PCR or isothermal amplification. After three to four weeks of coughing, bacterial DNA rapidly diminishes and you can't find it anymore by NAS. The sensitivity and specificity is high, but varies depending on the target gene. I will come back to that. Because molecular methods are so sensitive, you should be careful about contamination. When vaccination is done with whole cell vaccine, this is a potential source for contamination. Disadvantages are that the sensitivity drops rapidly after three to four weeks of coughing. It is expensive. You can use the test on antibiotics, but the dead bacteria seem to get cleared rapidly. So after five days, the test could be negative. The advantages are the excellent sensitivity and the speed. The test takes about one to two hours. So time to result depends more on transport time and organization in the lab. For molecular tests, you need a specific target gene. And in case of Bordetella, this could be a hard choice. The first column shows you the target gene. The second column, in how many copies the gene is present in the genome. And the third column indicates in which of the Bordetella species. For Bordetella pertussis, the main targets are the IS481 with 200 copies per genome and the pertussis toxin promoter, which is only a single copy gene. This has an impact on sensitivity. If you choose IS481, you might also detect Bordetella holmesii and lose specificity. The PTX the PTX promoter region, on the other hand, is specific for Bordetella pertussis, but present, but present in a low copy number. Now you have to choose between specificity and sensitivity. In our lab, we prefer IS481. For your test, you need to know which target will was chosen for Bordetella pertussis and if Bordetella parapertussis is included. Homebrew tests often take IS481 and include Bordetella parapertussis. And the table shows different commercially available assays and their selection of target genes, including the three tests that uh, I will present later for the study. So to wrap up, the optimal test depends on the age. For neonates and infants, you should perform a PCR. For older patients, you need to consider the time passed since calf onset. PCR and culture can be performed from the start for about two to three weeks. 
because culture is so delicate, it should be combined with PCR in case it does not work. For serology, you need to wait two weeks for the antibody response to develop, but it might be used for up to three months. Now to part B, a study we performed in my lab. We compared three different molecular assays for the detection of Bordetella pertussis. The study was supported by the provider of the three assays, but they had no influence on the study design nor data analysis. We performed a prospective study about a year ago. 121 consecutive nasopharyngeal swaps with request for Bordetella pertussis were analyzed. We had to exclude eight of them where we could not get a result for all the assays. The samples were refrigerated upon arrival and analyzed within 27 hours. The samples came from two laboratories, from Bioanalytica in Lucerne with, with samples from central Switzerland and from MCL with samples from Bern and the French-speaking part of Switzerland. We needed an assay which is easy to perform, to use it on evenings and weekends when we work with reduced personnel. We compared the following three methods. BioFire film array respiratory panel, kit version 1.7 and 2 plus. This is, is a syndromic, highly multiplexed panel that uses nested PCR followed by melting curve analysis. Diazorin liaison MDX simplex Bordetella direct, that is a real-time PCR, and Illumigene pertussis from Meridian, which uses an isothermal amplification technology. Normally, our specimens from routine diagnostics go to MCL, where they are analyzed batch-wise by an in-house real-time PCR. In bold are the abbreviations I'm going to use in the talk. If an ESWAP arrived at Bioanalytica, the transport medium was, was diluted up to 1 ml, if necessary, and analyzed by the four different assays. The three tests on the left were performed in our lab, and the lab-developed test was carried out at MCL. If MCL received the specimens, they were diluted after the in-house testing, so the LDT did not have the same conditions as the other assays. The specimen volume needed in the different tests are indicated. Please note that we did not choose a reference system. A true positive was defined if two or more assays showed a positive result. These three are very different systems and this table shows some of the characteristics. For BioFire, the version changed during the study and we tested about half of the sample with each version. The RP2 plus characteristics are the ones in bracket in the biofire column. All of them use a different method. So you can test uh, one sample per module in the biofire, but up to eight for diazorin. Illumidin has two blocks, which can be started independently, and you can load up to five samples per block. The new version of BioFire is the fastest test with 45 minutes, but BioFire is also the most expensive one. And as I said before, have a look at the target for Bordetella pertussis. BioFire goes for specificity with the PTXP target and the other two for sensitivity with IS481. Um, Bordetella parapertussis was added in the new BioFire kit version and it is not included in the Illumigen assay. Those are our results. The upper table shows the data for Bordetella pertussis and the lower the ones for Bordetella parapertussis. N is the number of specimens. For the 100 
and 21 samples were 10 positive for Bordetella pertussis in all the assays. Two were positive with diastereen and the in-house test, and two were only positive in the in-house test, and therefore considered false positive. You can also see that the samples missed by some assays had high CT values. For Bordetella parapertasis, we only had two positive samples. One was detected by all methods, and the other one was missed by Biofire, but with the version that did not include Bordetella parapertasis. So it was not considered false negative for the um, for the calculation of sensitivity and specificity. Because Illumigene does not detect Bordetella parapertosis, it was not included in the lower table. So how do the performance characteristics look like? The inhibition and unresolved rate was very good for all three systems. 0.8% is one sample and 1.6% are two samples. Inhibition is when the PCR did not work due to inhibiting factors in the patient sample. Unresolved errors, on the other hand, are problems of the machine. With the data from the previous slide, you can calculate sensitivity, specificity, and positive and negative predictive value for our study group. Biofire and Illumigene only show a sensitivity of 83.3% compared to 100% for diazorin and LDT. I speculate that for Biofire this might be due to its target gene selection and for Illumigene it could be due to the LAMP technology or due to the low sample input of 25 microliters. This gives us a prevalence of 10% for Bordetella pertussis and 1.7% for parapertussis. Please be aware of the low statistical power due to the limited number of positive samples, especially for uh, parapertussis. So if you choose an instrument or a test for your lab, it is not only a question of sensitivity and specificity, a lot of other factors influence a lab decision, like what patients do you have, children immunosuppressed, what are the requirements of your customers, financial aspects, cost of the machine, test and personnel, what skills are needed from the person performing the test, what is the workflow in the lab, do you want random access or do you want to test in batches, and also what other tests can be performed on the, on the same instrument. To answer these questions, I put the differences between the machines in this table. All of them are easy to handle. That was a prerequisite for our study. I don't want to go into details, but pick a few aspects. Biofire is a very good system that offers several syndromic panels. Those are highly multiplexed and therefore more expensive than duplex or triplex tests. You cannot have a look at the curves. So there is a special program for that, but that takes uh, time and we don't do that in routine testing. The diazorine test was the most sensitive one for pertussis. One can analyze up to eight specimens, but it's not random access. It gives you the PCR curves and the CT values, so you can check the quality of the PCR by yourself. It can also be used as open system, as a normal thermocycler for in-house tests. The Illumigene test is the cheapest one in this comparison. It needs more steps than the others before you can load the machine and leave. The position, uh, the, the positive process control is not in the same tube as the patient sample like in the other ones. There is a malaria assay available which could be an interesting addition to microscopy. And of course uh, this table is uh, not exhaustive. 
choosing the IS481 gene target we might have for the Tela holmesii in our pertussis positive cases. So we wanted to have a closer look at the prevalence of holmesii in our cohort. We've analyzed 223 IS481 positive DNA extracts that were collected over the last one and a half years and stored at eight, minus 80 degrees. They were tested with the lab developed test of MCL originally. We used the BioGX Bordetella speciation plus toxin test on the BDMAX system for the species ID. Samples positive for Holmesii were confirmed by an external laboratory. And uh, the result was that we found two Holmesii cases, which gives us a prevalence of 0.9% in our sample cohort. So the conclusions of the study are, the choice of the target gene affects the sensitivity of the assay. We found a low inhibition and error rate for all instruments. The best one regarding, regarding sensitivity was the diazorin. The specificity was equally good in all systems. We found a low prevalence of B. holmesii in our study group. And uh, my take home messages. Pertussis is not only a childhood disease. At present, neither currently available vaccines nor previous pertussis infection can provide long-lasting protection against later infection. And the residual immunity may change the clinical presentation of pertussis in adolescents and adults. Unrecognized pertussis in adults is the major source of pertussis in infants. Fast and reliable diagnosis is necessary to treat the patient and stop the transmission chain. Optimal diagnostic testing depends on age, vaccination status, and time point of testing. And you need to know your diagnostic test to know its strengths and limitations. For the ones of you that are interested in more details, those are good uh, sources that I also used uh, for my talk. And um, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, we are thankful to everyone that contributed and supported, supported the study. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Berlinger, for that great presentation. I do have a couple of questions. I hope you have a, a few minutes um, to help answer these. The first question is, how important is it to be able to detect paraprotestis in addition to pertussis? Um, it is uh, less important because uh, paraprotestis has a smaller outbreak potential and it leads, uh, as I said, to milder clinical courses. But uh, in my opinion, the detection of parapertosis is important because uh, the problem is that there is not enough data on Bordetella parapertosis. And the consequence is that in most guidelines, they do not comment about therapy or post-exposure prophylaxis regarding Bordetella parapertosis. And uh, if the patient has severe symptom or it's a neonate that might have been exposed, you'll treat it the same way as Bordetella pertussis. So uh, in my view, it is important to gain more knowledge and to give the clinicians the option that antibiotics might be useful as therapy option or post-exposure post prophylaxis. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, why did you report that the possibility to see raw data in molecular testing is an advantage? For us, it is a possibility to check uh, the quality of a test. Our experience is that, at least for real-time PCR, 
the brain is better than the algorithm. So um, if we see a strange curve, we can repeat it. Or uh, if there is a small increase below the threshold, we can repeat the test or test it uh, with another method if, if one is available. So um, we very much like the possibility to do that. And uh, with that opinion, we are not alone in Europe. But uh, the situation in the U.S. is different, as I know, um, as uh, the FDA does not allow interference uh, with the test results. So you have to stick to what the machine says to the algorithm and not the brain. Okay, and we have one more question. Based on your experience, what is the rate of patients suspected of Bordetella but positive for RSV or vice versa? Um, for the study we've performed, we have some data about the question because all of the samples were analyzed with the respiratory panel of BioFire. So um, this gives us a nice insight what might be the cause of the symptoms of the patient. And um, we found that uh, for children, in 30% of the cases, more than one organism was detected, compared to approximately 15% in adults. RSV, we could find in 17% of the cases in children, but only in about 5% um, of the adults. And uh, the most prevalent pathogen in adults were influenza virus followed by um, reno enterovirus. And in children, it was uh, reno enterovirus followed by human metapneumovirus. So reno virus and enterovirus are, are not report or are reported as one target and cannot be further discriminated with the biofire. Okay, I think that's all we have um, as far as questions today. I want to once again thank you so much for this informative presentation, Dr. Berlinger. And if anyone has any additional questions, you can contact Dr. Berlinger at livia.berlinger at bioanalytica.ch. And with that, I would like to say um, goodbye to everyone and have a great day.